Hi, so before I share my latest Lenten painting series with you, I would just like to talk for a moment about how the painting process works for me. Painting is um, storytelling for me. So what's better than to be inspired through scripture, right? I really loved painting this series. You know, sometimes working on a painting can be laborious, frustrating, uh, confusing, and when what you're doing is just not satisfying. Sometimes it's the brush, sometimes the paint, color, uh, a little tiny line, um, a shape, a dot, a breath that you just can't get right. But this story is so important because in its dark journey, it exposes the most glorious, mysterious, unconditional, perfect love of Jesus. The weight of getting it right actually helps me open my hands and surrender my ego as somehow God guides my brush. I don't always listen right away, but when I do, it works. So, let's look at each of the four paintings and translate or try to translate what the brush put down on canvas. The first one is The Last Supper from Matthew 26, 20 through 21. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. My first thought was to paint the story inside the unfinished cross to show the foreshadowing of what was to come. In most of my work, the background work is done last because I like to use it to uh, punch up the, the subject matter. But in this series, though, it was imperative that I uh, start with the actual background color. A, because I wanted to include um, a hint of the story. For instance, this background might have been the color in my imagination of the upper room but more to show off or to bring out the unfinished cross. Here you want to be able to see it through those. If I had done these too dark or a different color, it wouldn't have been as complimentary. So I chose this story as the beginning of the journey Jesus took to the cross. I could have started with his triumphant entry into Jerusalem or when he predicts his death to his disciples for the third, the second, and the first time. Um, or even back to his birth, which is really when we first witnessed the mystery of the Savior. Well, if you don't count the Old Testament Jesus prophecies. So for me, this is the most powerful visual to start with, and the beginning of the end of his powerful time and purpose here. It is the night he shares his last meal with his closest and dearest friends. He tells them what is about to happen through ordinary, intimate acts of eating. He so often uses everyday life things, doesn't he? Like sheep and goats and, and grains of sand and wheat and, and uh, even a fig tree or the condition of the soil or a wedding invitation. And he still does that today. This was, however, such grave news. I would have said, okay, friends, sit down. I have some really, really bad news to tell you. Oh, it's going to be awful. You're going to hate hearing this. It's going to make you so sad. Inadvertently building the tension. Not Jesus. No grand gestures. No dramatic tears. He knows us so well. We need simple. Don't we too, as a family, share our hopes and dreams, our, our good news and bad, most effectively around the table? So, Jesus would have celebrated the Seder, the ritual Passover meal, that night. I showed just a sample of what they typically would have eaten. 
the um, unleavened bread, the bitter herbs, and the olives, and of course the aromatized wine. I chose these few items not only to uh, show, to, to draw you into the composition, but to emphasize texture, shape, color, um, and of course the symbolic meaning. Because I don't want you to, your eye to be saturated. If you put too much in there, blah, 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 it gets all jumbled and you, your eyes glaze over. So notice I painted three vessels, always high to low, large to small, back to front. Three is a powerful number, the Trinity. <laughs> What's more powerful? And in art, three creates the most impact. It's the perfect visual balance. I chose to include unleavened bread because it is such an ordinary necessity, the staff of life, usually to mop up the stew. But most importantly, Jesus used it to tell the disciples, this is my body broken for you. The wine jug, the large wine jug, is very ordinary, not fancy, not expensive, but again, used for a very priceless message. This is my blood shed for you, Jesus said. The olives balance the meal nicely. They have a, a smooth texture, a sharp color and taste, and they keep the composition interesting. Now, by contrast, the bitter herbs are fragile, delicate, and pungent, and used in the traditional Seder meal to symbolize Christ's suffering for our sins. This next painting is the Garden of Gethsemane, and my inspiration came from Matthew 26, 45 through 46. Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So again, this story is set in the um, unfinished cross so as to depict the uh, foreshadowing of what was to come. I've been thinking of painting this series and this scene for many, many years. This scene especially. Um, I had it visualized and planned long before the others. I so badly wanted to start, but I knew my brain couldn't handle if I painted it out of sequence. Um, I just absolutely loved doing this one. Uh, I, I guess because it just really moved me. Now just to back up, um, I wanted to describe the background, why I chose this color, and it is more or less to depict the color of the olive tree leaves. So, it is night in the garden. I picture Jesus so weary, so exhausted, upset that his friends were not praying with him like he'd asked, knowing everything that was going to come. In fact, he was so stressed, he actually was sweating drops of blood. And I read in my research that the human body can actually sweat drops of blood, that it has to be under extreme, unbelievable distress. So he was sweating drops of blood as he asked God not to make him go through this suffering. Yet with such steadfastness, he was able to push through and say, not my will, but yours be done. In this scene, I imagined him taking one final breath of support as he leans tentatively against the tree knowing what heinous acts are about to come. He hears the loud, threatening Roman soldiers and his betrayer, Judas, storming into the garden. He sees the light of the torches coming closer as he wakes the sleeping disciples. I attempted to make the olive trees a, a place of um, quiet stillness, a place to pray like you might do in the furthest, quietest part of the attic or the bottom of your garden at your home. Juxtapositions against the noise of the angry crowd as the trees become blanketing protectors, 
yet more exposed by the flames of the enemy. This painting represents the story of where Jesus is flogged. One final time, the story is set in the unfinished cross to de depict the foreshadowing of what was to come, now so very soon. I chose this color in the background because it was probably in a dirt, sandy area within the palace that um, he would have been flogged, and I wanted that to come across. And it's, it's very clay-filled in that region, so that's why also these colors. So I chose Mark 15, 15 through 19 as my inspiration. Pilate had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. How could I possibly depict what Jesus was suffering here? I could only tell the story by showing these three instruments of torture. The scourge, the purple robe, and the crown of thorns by staining them a little bit with blood. The scourging of 39 lashes was typically given to criminals. Not many survived such excruciating, heinous pain. Jesus' back and sides would have been flayed open into shreds. His lungs pierced, and it was very common for other organs to be damaged and for ribs to be broken by the brutal whipping of the sharp bones that were knotted into the scourge. However, scripture had to be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Quite miraculous, then, that this torture didn't break one single bone in Jesus' body. However, pain and humiliation wasn't excluded. After such torture, they shoved a crown of thorns on his head, then beat him on his head with a staff, laying open his ears and his face, which would have caused even more unbearable pain as the thorns spiked into the open wounds. It may appear that I exaggerated the length of these thorns, but they actually used a bush that had really, really long thorns on them. It just it was a particular type that grew very long thorns. Then they threw the purple robe on his back as they continued to mock him. I painted the purple robe to look rather luxurious, uh, kind of like velvet. It, in Luke it says it was an elegant robe. Could it make the mockery even more grand and fit for a king? So you see, I, I, I could not do this part of the story justice. Therefore, I chose to paint these three objects as a still life, like a royal bearing of arms of a heroic soldier king preparing to sacrifice his life for us. And finally, Jesus' death. This time, my inspiration for the painting came from Mark 15, 37 through 39. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. The cross is now in full visual effect. No longer a foreshadowing. It has happened. The heartbeat has stopped. In this painting, Jesus has just died. The indescribable torture he experienced over the last days of his life has ended. For just a moment in time, I wanted his face to look unharmed. I chose to paint him and the cross with some metallic coppers and golds to show his supernatural glory reflecting from him when he was recognized by the centurion as the Son of God, hence the unharmed face. The crown of thorns, which was meant only for torture, I also chose to paint in metallic coppers and golds, as that became his crown of glory. 
As he breathed his last, I had the sense that this glory light momentarily flashed from him before darkness came over the land. My hope is that these four paintings help you, as this process did me, to see and experience this impossible sacrifice. I wanted to say beautiful sacrifice, but that just sounds so wrong in our earthly understanding. To us, it's completely impossible. But from a heavenly perspective, completely beautiful. This sacrifice that our Lord made for us, for all of us, I hope will make you pause and soak in just how much God loves you.